Hello, and welcome to another podcast from Dr. Crunch. My name is Viral. And I'm Sheena. And today, we're going to be talking about warfarin. So, warfarin is one of those drugs we just have to know really, really well. It's used for so many things for so many patients. Um, the way we're going to structure this is firstly, talk about the common indications for warfarin. Uh, then we're going to talk about some of the geeky background to it. So it's half-life, onset of action, how it actually works, and try to explain why it's pro-thrombotic in the early stages. Then we're going to talk about some of the contraindications. And then we're going to mention what are the different ways you can start warfarin. We're then going to go through the common on-call scenarios. So the most common two we figured would be when the INR has gone out of control. And the second one would be when you're asked to prescribe warfarin for a patient you've never seen before. And finally, we're going to talk about how you explain warfarin to a patient who's starting it for the first time. We'll do it in a kind of an OSCE style. So because we know that um, warfarin regimes and protocols vary from hospital to hospital, what we try to do is use the most up-to-date recent guidelines taken from a variety of sources, such as the NICE guidelines um, and also BMJ Learning and the BNF. So Viral, what exactly are these indications for warfarin? The common indications can be split into the high risk and low risk indications. The high risk ones would be three things. So number one, metallic heart valves. Number two, DVTs. Number three, PEs. And the common low risk one, well, it's basically atrial fibrillation and you're trying to prevent a stroke happening. Uh, that's the logic behind the warfarin. Uh, so within AF, there are kind of two indications. There's the long term prevention of the stroke there's also pre and post cardioversion if so if you think a patient's suitable of cardioversion you give them three weeks pre and four weeks post uh, anticoagulation so Sheena I understand there's some less common indications as well yeah sure so um, there's actually three uh, in particular worth knowing about number one dilated cardiomyopathy number two mitral valve disease uh, where there's a particularly high risk of thrombosis. So what I mean by this is um, in the in the presence of atrial fibrillation or where there's left atrial enlargement. And the third being the, the presence of thrombophilia. Any examples? Like antiphospholipid syndrome. So let's look at some of the geeky background to warfarin. Sheena, what is the mechanism of warfarin? Well, warfarin antagonizes vitamin K. The dependent coagulation factors being factors 2, 7, 9 and 10. Okay, so you give warfarin and you're going to reduce the levels of these coagulants. Yeah, that's right. But also protein C and S are dependent on vitamin K. Ah, oh, so what's the significance of that? So protein C and S are anticoagulants. Their half-lives are in the realms of hours, whereas the half-life of the factors 2, 7, 9 and 10 are in the realms of days. So when you start warfarin, you're basically stopping the synthesis of all of these guys. And because of the half-lives, protein C and S drop off first before the anticoagulants. Okay, so what are the clinical consequences of this? Well, the, in the initial days of starting warfarin, you're actually in a procoagulant state. Okay, so how does this relate to the, uh, the latest clinical guidance on starting warfarin? Well, in a high-risk patient, heparin is given with the initiation of warfarin for at least five days and until INR has been therapeutic for two days. So Viral, how exactly does the dosing of warfarin relate to the INR? So warfarin takes about two to five days to have its full effect. So if you're trying to judge the impact of a change in dose or a new dose, you'd have to wait about two to three days probably, at least um, before you measure the INR to judge the impact of that dose. So tell me about some of the contraindications to warfarin. Okay, as with any medication, you can split contraindications to absolute and relative. The absolute contraindications would be any significant active bleeding. And so in particular, hemorrhagic stroke would be the worst place ever to give warfarin. Uh, you also avoid it giving within 48 hours after someone's given birth. In terms of cautions, well, anything where you've got increased risk of bleeding would be a caution. So uh, history of GI bleeding, peptic ulcers, recent surgery. Uh, you'd also, after an ischemic stroke, you'd want to leave at least 14 days because there is a risk of hemorrhagic transformation. Now then, Sheena, pretty much every patient who starts warfarin in my hospital seems to be going on this 10-10-5 starting regime. Is that, is that the right thing? Not exactly. According to guidelines, you initially need to assess whether a patient's high risk or not. Okay. So in a high risk patient, 
you can do the loading regime that you've just spoken about. However, it's important to um, be cautious in some patients, particularly the elderly, and those with liver failure or potential drug interactions. And what about low risk patients? Well, of course, follow your hospital pr- um, protocol, but um, it's generally advised that between one and three milligrams can be given daily and then to check the INR after a week. So are there any advantages to using the slower regime? Yeah, so you're reducing the risk of bleeding um, that you might get with the more aggressive um, loading re- regime. And also um, there's, there's less chance of the um, procoagulant state Cool. And uh, is there anything you'd like to do before you start warfarin? Yeah. Always do a um, baseline INR just so that you have a starting point and also to identify any coagulopathies. Oh, now, since you're mentioning taking INRs, in our hospital, and I think in most hospitals, they give you a blue tube to fill and you always have to fill it up right to the top. Do, do you know why? Yeah, because at the bottom of the um, the blue t- blood tube um, is, is citrate. And unless the tube is diluted and with enough blood... High citrate concentrations can cause a falsely elevated INR. So why might the INR be deranged? The causes of a deranged INR can be split into patient factors, pharmaceutical factors and disease factors. Patient factors would be poor compliance or confusion. So particularly, say, an elderly patient who's uh, maybe losing their vision and didn't quite distinguish between the colours of the tablets. And for this reason, people with impaired vision are actually only given white tablets to avoid any... um, um, misunderstandings. Okay, so the pharmaceutical causes of uh, raised INR, well, most this is actually the most common cause, a drug interaction, that's usually what deranges your INR. And uh, if you have enzyme inducers or inhibitors, they would decrease and increase the effect of warfarin respectively. So, the way we like to remember our enzyme inducers are with the mnemonic CRAP GPs, which some of you might have heard of. C standing for carbamazepine. R standing for rifampicin. A for alcohol chronic. Uh, P for phenytoin. G for griseofulvin. P for phenobarbitone. And S for sulfonyl or ureas. Okay, and then there are lots of different ways of trying to remember the enzyme inhibitors. But I just found if you use the crap GP's harmonic and just work down it and kind of think of the mirror image or the evil twin of each of those, then it seems to produce the list for the, uh, for the inhibitors. So, starting at the top, carbamazepine. So, the C... Carbamazepine is partnered with... Valparate. Okay, and the R... Can be partnered with isoniazid. And the chronic alcohol can be partnered with... Acute alcohol. Okay, and the P is again an antiepileptic. If we go to the G, the griseofulvin, that can be partnered with... The antifungals, so things like fluconazole. So that can remind us of the other antibiotics, such as metronidazole. Which in turn can remind us of other antibiotics, like the macrolides most commonly. And then while we're on the theme of azoles, we can think of omeprazole. And then finally, we've got our last S, which is partnered with sulfonyl urea to give us... It's sulfonamides. And then finally, the uh, disease factors. So any sort of heart failure, liver failure, and any systemic pyrexial illness, all of these can tend to bump up the INR. So we've talked about the causes of a high INR. Now let's talk a bit about how to treat a high INR. So how do we do it, Vera? Okay, well... It basically depends on two factors, whether or not the patient's bleeding and what the INR level is. If the patient is having a major bleed, which is basically any sort of intracranial bleed, any major GI bleed, or any um, inter-articular bleeds, then you need to reverse it immediately. And the way you do that is by giving dried prothrombin complex, which contains factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. You'd also give... uh, your vitamin k iv but that takes a little while to act so the thing which is saving them right now and replacing the missing factors is that dried prothrombin complex if that's not available and only if that's not available would you use fresh frozen plasma Uh, if there's minor so that's the major that's if you're having a major bleed it doesn't matter what the inr is if you're having a major bleed so what about minor bleeds well if you're having a minor bleed then uh you basically, obviously, you'd stop the warfarin and you give vitamin K, about one to three milligrams, by a slow IV injection. And you'd only restart the warfarin when the INR has dropped less than five. And of course, the bleeding has stopped. And what about if there's no bleeding? Well, if there's no bleeding, then it depends on the INR. If it's more than eight, again, you'd stop the warfarin. And you might consider giving some vitamin K uh, by mouth, about one to five milligrams. 
If the INR is between 5 and 8, then you would stop the warfarin and only restart when the INR drops below 5. So Shuna, if you're called in the middle of the night by this nurse who says, oh, this patient needs warfarin prescribing, uh, how are you going to approach that? Well, I'd, I'd ask for the following information. Firstly, the, the, indi- the indication for the warfarin therapy, their target INR, whether they have a usual regime or not, when their last INR was done and what it was, also whether there, there's any acute active bleeding, and also any patient morbidity and pharmacological factors that might affect the, the INR. Okay, so let's take a pretty common scenario. Um, say the patient's got a target of 2 to 3, and uh, you look on the drug chart, the last INR was 3.5, so the patient takes 3 milligrams every day. What, what would you actually do next? Well, because the INR is still under 5, I wouldn't omit the dose, but I would consider reducing it to, say, for example, 2 milligrams, but I'd bear in mind that the INR isn't going to um, show its full effect for the next 48 hours. I'd also want to look for a um, a precipitant for this INR increase. Okay, and are there any precautions uh, one must observe when stopping warfarin? No, it can be stopped straight away without any tapering. Okay, so let's just run through the kind of things you'd explain to a patient who's just been started on warfarin for the first time. We'll do it in a sort of OSCE style role play, um, and we'll cover all the major points. Hello. Hi. Hello, my name's Ro, I'm one of the junior doctors. Can I just double check your name, age and date of birth, please? Yeah, I'm um, Mrs Fitzpatrick. My date of birth is the 14th of the 10th, um, 1949, and I'm 62. Okay, that's fine. So, um, Mrs Patrick, um, I don't know how much someone's explained to you. Are, are you aware of... Uh, what I've come to discuss. Warfarin. Yeah, but what do you understand at the moment about warfarin? That it's rat poison. Okay, yes, it used to, well it is, it could be used as a rat poison, that was initially how it was developed. Um, But the way we use it in people is as a blood thinning agent. Uh, Do you have any idea why we might be doing that? Um, Well, I've been told because I've got this new heart valve in. Yeah, that's right. So with this metal heart valve, uh, there's a risk that uh, Bits from the blood may clot, okay, and what this and then those clots can go around the body and cause problems. Uh, So what we want to do is keep the blood nice and thin to prevent those clots from happening. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So, what is there anything you know about any particular concerns or worries you have about warfarin at the moment? Um, Just that, from what I understand, it's got lots of restrictions Hmm. on my life. Well, yes, there are a few uh, restrictions. So what I'd like to do is just talk about how it would work and then we'll go through some of the so-called restrictions and lifestyle adjustments. So uh, you'll be given what's called a target INR. Now, INR is um, uh, the name of a test to measure how thin or thick your blood is. Okay, And we have a target for you. In your case, it's between three and four. Okay, And uh, the more warfarin we give, the higher your INR will go. The less warfarin, the lower it will go. If the INR is too low, then you're at risk of getting clots. If the INR is too high, you're at risk of bleeding. So it's really important we keep you in that range three to four. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Okay. And the way we keep you in that range is by doing regular blood tests to check that we are in the right range. And if we're not, we may need to increase or decrease the dose. Does that make sense? Yeah. So okay. when you say regular blood tests, hmm. what do you mean? Well, initially we start. Uh, we'll be starting. Um, we'll do the blood test more frequently it may be uh, daily initially it may drop to um, a weekly after that and then t- every two weeks or four weeks depending on how stable uh, your INR is uh, obviously if there's a sudden change then we and your uh, INRs then we might want to monitor them more frequently so it's very individual as to how frequent they are but initially we'll be following you more closely does that make sense yeah okay um, and after you go to for your blood test we'll make a recommendation for your um, for your dose for the next week or so or two weeks, and so we'll pro- we'll provide you with uh, coloured tablets. You you haven't got any visual impairments. No. No. So we'll give you some coloured tablets, and we'll tell you at the end of each um, blood test appointment, um, or, or bring up the next day potentially, to let you know how many tablets of which colour you should be taking each day. Does that make sense? Yeah. And we'll give you a written record so you can to do to make it easier to remember. Okay. Okay. Um. So this process, as long as you have the metallic heart valve, then you'll stay on warfarin for life. Oh. Okay. Um, and like all things, there are risks and benefits. Um, so 
there is a risk of, um, well, the benefit is to prevent the clot. And the major risk I should let you know about is, well, bleeding is the main risk. Um, so it's really important you check for bleeding uh, and you let us know immediately if you notice anything unusual. So, for example, if you've uh, noticed any bleeding from any wounds, if you notice uh, any headaches or um, any confusion, or if you notice that you're vomiting quite a lot, uh, if you notice any, if you're coughing up any um, blood, or if you notice if there's any uh, any dark vomit coming out, or if you notice any black stools or dark stools, or any blood in the stools. Also, if you notice if your urine looks any red or pink or a different colour to normal, if you let us know. Uh, the other place where you can bleed is into your joints, so if your joints get hot and swollen, mm. you should let us know. Does that make sense so far? Yeah, I think so, Doctor. Okay. Um, uh, if you... Uh, while, while you're on warfarin, we also recommend you keep off uh, aspirin, unless a doctor has specifically recommended this, because there's an increased risk of bleeding. Okay, so if you could avoid taking over-the-counter aspirin. Okay. Um, in addition, we would ask you to not take any over-the-counter drugs, um, or indeed, uh, without, without checking with your doctor first, because lots of drugs interact with warfarin. Okay. Uh, and various medications which your doctor may prescribe can also interact, so... You need to make sure that your doctor is always aware that you're on warfarin before he prescribes you any new drug. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Is, are there any questions or concerns at the moment? Not right now, no. Okay. Um, we'd also suggest, well, we also strongly recommend that you avoid um, binge drinking while you're on warfarin because that can interact and, again, uh, increase the risk of you bleeding. Mm. Um, other, you mentioned lifestyle restrictions. In general, we contacts we would not recommend contact sports or heavy um sport, sports with lots of falls and uh, a risk of violence in the sport because again there's a high risk of bleeding oh there's no risk of that doctor okay um and if if you were th- just to let you know that we do not recommend warfarin if you're ever pregnant so if you if you feel that 62 62 so it's unlikely in your case very unlikely but just in case okay <laughs> um and in terms of diet, well, normally people with warfarin do eat a generally an unrestricted diet, apart from a few points. A grapefruit juice, we recommend you do not take. And try not to go overboard on uh, the green leafy vegetables, because um, they might kind of uh, cancel out the effect of warfarin. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so if you do have any other questions, uh, please do not hesitate to get in touch with uh, our team. We'll make sure you have their contact details, and there's an information leaflet Warfarin, I'll make sure you have. Um, no, do you have no other problems or concerns or anything else you'd like to bring up? No, I think that's fine for now. Thank you. Okay. Doctor. Well, thanks very much. And um, yeah, I will please get in touch if you have any concerns.